Morning, everybody. Um, I'm not exactly sure what to call this. Uh, it's not really, it's not an etude and it's not a riff, but we're going to learn a lot from this. And I can't tell you how pleased I am uh, to have this guitar in my shop for a little while so that I can show it off to you. And it is in its original mid 70s hard shell wooden case. A 1976 DeQuisto New Yorker Special, which um, is uh, uh, on its way to its new owner. So let me get this out here and, and we'll have a look at this guitar. <laughs> so Really, I, I love this guitar. <laughs> um, the guitar is, uh, is very special to me for a couple of reasons. One of which is that I first saw this guitar in 1975, um, which is the date on the inside, although I guess it was delivered in the next year. But Jimmy dated the box, of course, when he glued it together. And uh, so in 1975, when I made my first uh, visit at his shop, uh, this guitar was in a mold. Of course, I didn't know which one it was, but it certainly was in progress. Um, it's dated 7-24-1975, and I was in his shop in uh, August. So I surely saw this in some stage of some stage of process. Uh, it, it's my contention, and I think a lot of people that know Jimmy's work agree that this is kind of a golden period for him. Um, he was 40 years old in 1975. And uh, let's see, it would have been um, 13 years since the death of his mentor, John D'Angelico. So he'd had over a decade to get his own style of building together and run his own shop. Um, and at this point, he was um, through the turbulence that, that he experienced when John D'Angelico died in 1964 and had gotten things straightened out and he had some uh, some new ideas which he added to the recipe that he originally received from John D'Angelico. And I'd like to show you this guitar from my point of view and point out some, some, some of the things that I'm, I see when I look at this marvelous thing. So first of all, let's just have a look at the cool material in here. I mean, this is just a lovely um, Alpine well, it's an Alpine set, so this wood all comes from Germany, the wood in the body, um, and it was cut somewhere in the, in the Alps, who knows where. But uh, curly maple, of course, for the back and sides um, from, from the uh, Alpine region in Europe. And likewise, the top is also uh, an Alpine spruce top. Uh, we see quite, uh, quite close grain spacing. Maybe, what do we have? Oh, I don't know. Oh, maybe 12 lines per inch less here, maybe 10. But anyway, fairly close, not, not too tight, but, but really, really beautiful material. Um, and, and perfectly vertical grain. You can see the cross grain silking or medullary rays just laying right here on the top where it belongs, indicating that um, the wood is cut exactly correctly um, for a guitar top. So, and this was, I believe, his default material for almost all of his career was wood that was sourced from, from German suppliers um, and was really cut for cellos. Um, which are, of course, a little bit bigger than archtop guitars. So, um, 
Let's start off with, uh, with looking at the neck. And um, I will say that, first of all, we're going we're gonna to state that Jimmy DeQuisto learned guitar making from John D'Angelico, period, end. He didn't read technical journals or books by other builders. He didn't go to seminars with other builders and try and figure out which end was up. He had one instructor, um, and, and he built in the style of John D'Angelico, uh, at least at first when he, uh, when he was out on his own. Let's uh, consider the neck. We have a headstock that is his own design with this uh, oval space here, and, um, but he's still using the traditional turned brass finial, um, which is kind of like a Victorian furniture theme. Uh, but, you know, some nice curves and plenty of uh, purfling to go along with it. A pretty tricky, challenging job to do this thing. Uh, but he did a lovely job. You can see the joints are beautiful. Um, very, very clean work. Uh, the, the headstock is a piece of dyed pear wood, which was probably a little blacker than it is now. Um, where it appear it presents as a kind of a brown, a deep, a deep brown, and sometimes it has a green, a greenish tone to it, but I'm not seeing that in this one. So it just looks kind of like a chocolatey brown. Um, this guitar is presented as is from its original owner, has almost not a mark on it, and. Uh, is in lovely, lovely condition. So the, the fingerboard proportions, the inlay style, uh, nut material and so on, um, and the details on the back of the head are all <coughs> in accordance with uh, John D'Angelico's practices, uh, you can see that this is a, a flat sawn piece of dyed material, uh, not, not, uh, not an ebony or some other uh, tropical hardwood. So this is maple from the North, North America um, that's been dyed commercially. And then we see the neck is a, a, a light flame maple. It's a little bit um, a little bit more flamed on, on one side than the other, and it's rift sawn, but um, nice straight, relaxed piece of wood without too much figure. And I know from talking to Jimmy about neck material that this is what he preferred. In other words, uh, he didn't like necks that had too deep a curl in them because he felt that you couldn't depend on the material to stay straight. <laughs> uh, in, in use. Um, so some other general comments about the guitar. The, of course, many of you know that the celluloid bindings that John D'Angelico and then Jimmy DeQuisto were able to purchase and use on these instruments were of variable quality, shall we say. And sometimes they really, really let these folks down because um, they were made imperfectly and they outgassed and fell apart, sometimes damaging the rest of the guitar by staining or interfering in some way chemically with the finish. Um, there are plenty of pictures of D'Angelico's pickguards with the, um, the this plastic portion in the center just reduced to crumbles and the only thing that that remains was the <laughs> was the the plastic binding on the outside. So this whole family of cellulose materials is kind of unstable, um, and well, maybe that's enough. We'll say about it for right now. But having said that, on this guitar, there is no evidence whatsoever of the plastic material doing anything that it wasn't expected to do. Jimmy did a great job on the plastic binding. It just looks super good. Um, uh, for those of you who are 
not familiar with this way of, of painting and, and coloring a guitar, what happens is um, after a sealer coat is applied, some color coats are, are sprayed on the guitar until you get this beautiful tone and color, the sunburst finish. And then with a little scraper, the builder goes around and scrapes the color off the plastic binding, um, which sounds just as scary as it really is. I mean, one slip and you're right back to the beginning. So, and you'll see that in here, the, he's got to scrape this somehow um, with nothing to refer to. I don't really know how he did it, but he did a great job. And in fact, when you touch the guitar, maybe you can see in the, in the image, there's a step here where this part of the guitar where the white binding is, um, is lower than the painted parts of the guitar because of the thickness of the colored finish. And you can also, um, you can also feel the step around the edge of the guitar. And this isn't a defect, it's just a um, natural uh, part of the process that, uh, that everybody used, and Gibson did the same thing. It's, it's how you get the color off the binding. L later in his career, Jim Hall uh, was commissioning a guitar from Jimmy, and, and he saw the guitar before Jimmy scraped the binding off, and he said to Jimmy, gosh, that looks great, what's next? And Jimmy said, well, the next thing is I scrape the collar off the bindings. And Jim Hall said, maybe don't do that. I kind of like the way it looks. So it was a little more understated look. Um, but this, this guitar was prior to that idea, certainly. Now, you can see I just called this, this plastic binding white. And of course, it doesn't appear white. And that's because <clears throat> Jimmy sprayed some tinted colors uh, and tinted uh, transparent coats on top of the uh, of the everything after the the binding was scraped clear, so it was white. You can see places where it's worn, where it's, um, or you can see on the edge of the pickguard, which didn't get sprayed at all. Um, okay. When I received this guitar, I did two things before I did anything else, um, and one of them was I. I lubricated the truss rod nut, and the other one was I cleaned the threads on the bridge adjusters and lubricated them so I could actually operate them. Uh, the bridge adjusters on this guitar are um, 832 pitch, which uh, metric size would be about four millimeters. And the studs on the bridge are made of steel, and the, the thumb wheels are made of uh, brass, so that's good to have the two different materials. Um, however, the this guitar lived, I believe, in Bermuda uh, its whole life, and I guess the maritime climate um, was a little bit too much for the steel, and both posts were pretty corroded. So I had to go in there with a threading die and chase chase off the corrosion on those uh, upright posts in the bridge and lubricate them to get the bridge to operate correctly. The guitar is strung right now with a set of 12 flat wound strings. I'm not sure exactly what the new owner will prefer, round wound nickel strings, or uh, of course I'm gonna try and talk him into putting bronze strings on the guitar, but as we've discussed, uh, bronze strings will not drive this pickup properly uh, because um, of their magnetic signature. Uh, bronze is not a magnetic material, whereas nickel is. Speaking of the electronics, there's some interesting wrinkle in, this, um, in the electronics on this guitar, and I'm going to explore that in another segment. Um, we're going to look at this guitar in depth because I think it's a really important instrument. This instrument comes right at the, the beginning of what I guess many of us think of as the Jimmy's greatest period of creativity and uh, 
his best guitars, the guitars that he made uh, when he was in his 40s. All right, so we'll move to the body in some other areas. We've got a, uh, this beautiful ebony tailpiece. Um, it's a two-part hinge affair. It's got a, a brass plate. I'm going to light this up a little bit. It's got a brass plate. Uh, some of them had a little engraved line around the edge. This one's missing that. It's got a little black paint on it here. Um, and uh, Jimmy created a hinge um, with some kind of steel pin in there so that the tailpiece can hinge up and down and, and aim the way the, uh, the way it wants to in response to the string pressure. Now, we can see here at the tailpiece, there's a little piece of foil. It looks like copper foil that connects all the strings uh, in a ground situation, except that there's no ground wire that I could see any evidence of. So perhaps this tailpiece was something that uh, was designed for a different kind of electronic situation. I don't really know. So now let's have a look at, um, just for fun, have a look at our case candy that came with this guitar. <laughs> Case candy. We have a truss rod wrench um, and a, a, a cord, output cord, so we'll get into this a little more, but you can see that the, the cord is an eighth inch connector uh, on the side of the pick guard. And, um, And we have three sets of strings. Um, uh, DeQuisto brand, uh, a medium set, which is 13 to 56 bronze, a light set, which is uh, 12 to 53 bronze, and a D'Angelico Soul Rock electric roller wound strings, which are a set of eight to 38s. That's right, it's eight thousandths for the top string. So pretty sure this was a non-authorized set. These probably were supplied by Jimmy. Um, and let me emphasize that they're bronze strings. So acoustic guitar strings. That's what Jimmy considered he was building. And um, even though there's a pickup on this guitar, if you string it up with bronze strings, and we will, uh, it'll have a whole different, whole different tone. So here's a reprint um, that came in the case, and it's a reprint from Guitar Player Magazine from 1970. Um, I haven't been able to find a, the whole article, I mean the whole magazine as a reprint. And a nice note that we'll talk about in the um, in the, uh, the section that we do about pickups, but I will mention <laughs> that apparently Jimmy forgot to put in the strap button near the neck, and so in this letter, the, our instructions, along with this little drawing that he made to show where to drill the hole to install a strap button. So some assembly required, apparently. Anyway, I am just thrilled that this guitar is here and that uh, it's my job to, uh, to straighten it out a little bit before it goes on to its new owner. Jimmy was really important to me as a mentor and, uh, and, as, and as a friend, and he was uh, generous with his time. Uh, the first time I called him um, in, in the summer of 1975 to, to see if I could bring uh, my first archtop guitar for a critique, he told me, 
oh, gee, I'd love to, but I'm so busy, I'm so busy. Oh, I just, come Saturday. So that was Jimmy, come Saturday. <laughs> what a guy.